just tolerate their absence and you just don't get those features. And then I think this becomes a lot easier or well, more straightforward because they never block having a cluster that is working and functional sans these features. Um, I am starting to see uh, use of these um, get made more and more required. Uh, there's something around bringing up CSI plugins, nodes with CSI plugins and having them report status and having the kubelet uh, not report itself ready um, until it finds this API and reports status. So I don't, um, I, I guess maybe the first question is, are these acceptable to use for like required functionality? Is it acceptable for a component to block startup or fail to start up um, if one of these things is not available? Which, what do you mean by these things? CRD based uh, APIs. <clears throat> Is it acceptable for it when you say component? I'm just restating your state your question. Is it acceptable for a component? What is a component? A part of the I, the one I have in mind in particular is Kubelet, but I would say any of the components required that are on the path to getting running pods. So that's I guess API server, scheduler, controller manager, Kubelet, Cube proxy, the the big five, I guess. Right. Is it acceptable for one of those to fail if a required CRD is missing? I think the answer is yes, but we can define what fail means, like sit in a loop and retry. The scheduler can't do anything if there's no pods, right? Right, so I, I guess what I'm trying to pin down is how will we know if we've introduced a cycle? Um, if we've gone down a path where an API that's required to start things is blocking starting of the things that is required to install it, in, in a sense. So like a CRD that has a webhook that requires a pod that can't start because the CRD doesn't exist. So, I mean, you're, you're two years ahead of where we are now, but you know that's normal for you, so. Um, it's your, it's your, the Jordan time machine. Um, if we're not, we're not talking about pods yet, but I think when we do talk about pods as a CRD, there have to be rules like pods can't depend on validation that depends on pods. Like that doesn't seem like a, an arguable position. Right. And I, I don't think, I think that's exactly where we are today. Like today there's a CRD that blocks Kubelet startup that would prevent pods from running. And there's a desire to have that CRD use a validating webhook that depends on pods running. Like that's not, like that's where we are today. Uh, well, I don't think that we can, well, I don't, we don't know which, CR, which PR that is. Um, this is for CSI node info because it requires some more, um, it, it needs more special validation on the semantics of the and what the uh, schema can define. But I think, I mean, we discussed this as a workaround. We can live without the, the validation webhook. We could just validate on the server side when, when we're handling the requests, or we can validate in all the controllers that we need to. We actually already do have circular dependencies in CNI, right? We, we cannot bring up arbitrary pods without CNI having run first, and we, we bypass it using the host network thing, right? So that's, that's how we cheat. Like, host network pods don't need, don't need network to be ready, and so the CNI drivers run with host network, even if they don't actually need host network, other than to like bypass the initialization, what would otherwise be an initialization loop. So we could require something like that, right? Your validation webhook has to tolerate the, the, the CSI not being ready in the same way that CNI drivers tolerate networking not being ready. Yes, so, I mean, so I, I, something like that is a, is a way to break the cycle. Um, 
The other answer is that we should also make the declarative validation robust enough that most of these core components don't need validation webhooks, right? And like I've talked with Mehdi about this sort of at length about how complicated it can get. I think he, he, at least, I don't know if he's working on it anymore, but uh, we had some hand wavy answers to how we can make validation do cross field references and those sorts of things. I don't know exactly what validation we need here, but like that should be clear. We should probably also make it possible for validation to be serviced by something running master side. Like I should be able to provide uh, a custom controller or agent that runs, you know, as part of the control plane. So maybe not as a normal pod uh, that would be able to service. Uh, pardon the expression. These. Um, yeah. So what? One of the. Uh, we're also taking. Look at looking at getting the admission stuff to GA and one of the questions was around uh, what can you target like today you can target a service or a URL and cases like this where we want to distribute stuff and have it um, be runnable locally without hitting pods or, or things like that being able to point to like a local host thing and run your validating things sidecar sidecars or, or peer to your API server would make a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we're taking uh, to that to see if that would make sense. Um, Tim, to your point, uh, St. Clair, too many Tims, uh, around um, like ownership of this. I, in, in my mind, what this looked like was like something like an add-on where this is just running as another thing that the, the cluster lifecycle mechanism for um, setting up daemon sets or deployments or whatever uh, can slurp in and lay down. Like I wasn't anticipating this having like deep special hooks into um, into the cluster setup. As much as possible, I would like it to be just here are resources that are required. We're gonna set them down. Like that was my ideal. I don't know. Um, they I don't need know to what be, the blockers for that are, but yeah, they need to be versioned and managed as a thunk now. As you get more and more APIs, the problem is like it needs to be its own thing, its own living entity. Like it's a, whether it be a bundle, a well-defined version bundle for a given release mm -hmm. uh, that's managed as a third-party thing, but it, it needs its own life cycle independent of what the deployment tool uses. It needs to be applied as part of the process of, of bootstrapping. Agree. I mean, in the sort of principle of another level of interaction, um, what we don't want is for individual components to be registering their own stuff, right? I think we do want a managed versioned model of schema that is correlated to a Kubernetes version, not to an API machinery version. Um, at risk of getting into implementation details, it seems like we need a controller whose job is to load schema, make sure schema exists, go to sleep, come back. And whether that component is literally part of controller manager or part of a separate controller as a separate component, I don't actually really care. I think that there's reasonable arguments in both directions. Um, but we need something that is not the add-on manager, because there isn't the add-on manager, that doesn't treat this like an add-on, that says this is actually a fundamental part of the system. Of, it is the Kubernetes payload that loads into the generic-ish API server. As the API server gets more generic, stuff moves out of the API server and into the Kubernetes payload loader. If you limit yourself to declarative things, that becomes a lot more possible. As soon as you start having that uh, custom resource, like need to call out two places. Um, having that uh, that central like loader um, also be responsible for making sure that the the receiving endpoints are running and active and everything. Um, that starts to look a lot of different ways on every possible deployment. Um, so if it's just the declarative bits that's actually pretty reasonable to do. Uh, 
Um, can, can we get more detailed on like what we think is complicated there, Jordan? On uh, like why you can't um, have that also set up like all of the executable bits for webhooks? Yeah, I mean, imagine that there's a directory somewhere that we check in. Let's call it a directory called cluster. And uh, you check in a bunch of YAML into that directory that is your CRDs and the things you need to service those CRDs. Today, that would probably include pods and services to handle the webhooks. Maybe over time, we would have some sort of self-referential way of mentioning something that runs as a sibling to the master, uh, or the declarative API would get better, so we wouldn't need those things. But for now, let's assume it does. What would be the trouble with having a component whose job was effectively like the crappy shell add-on manager today, which is like, make sure these things exist. That's all it really does, right? So even, even the add-on manager doesn't run in every cluster, right? Yeah, well, we have an opportunity to sort of set by fiat how this thing's gonna work here. Right, can, I, can I ask a stupid question, just take a step back for a second? Like, what, what is the fundamental benefits or suppositions being made with re regards to moving core APIs out into CRDs? What are the benefits versus the trade-offs that we incur in doing this? Like, what, from, a, from a consumer's perspective, I see only extra complexity. Uh, from, from a, what, what are the good things that we are getting? The good things I think are, I was waiting for somebody else to jump on this one. Um, I, I think the good things are two. Uh, one is that by forcing us to eat our own dog food, we make sure that the extension mechanisms are actually viable. And two, we get really generic machinery that we don't need to rebuild a Kubernetes API server. There's just the API server. And that API server happens to work with Kubernetes, but it can also work with other payloads that are not Kubernetes. I don't know what that means. Like, what does that last statement mean? Go without Kubernetes. I want to run arbitrary other API server without Kubernetes as part of it. Today, we have three separate API server projects. We've got the generic API server, which has very few things loaded into it. We've got the Kubernetes API server, and we've got the API machinery. And the relationships between these things are uh, complicated and hard for people to, to, to reason about. So, so here's my my fundamental problem. I, we, over the course of the project, we have traded one complexity for another in the, in, the, in the hopes or the vision of a grand unified field theory of things, like staging is an example, right? <laughs> Where we had this grand unified field theory that like we alluded to staging and it'll be great and we'll federate the repositories and all be rainbows and kittens, but it ended up at a, a cat ass trophy, right? So like, <laughs> So the the it just lives in that way in perpetuity now, and we've learned to live with it. I so actually don't think it's as bad as people think it is, and I'm saying that having come from the other position. So, but that's a different discussion. Yes, yeah, so that's a separate discussion. But we live with these half half implemented states of a, of a beautiful vision of the future. And the question I have is like, I don't understand the beautiful vision of the future and the way we get there and why doing X makes a ton of sense. Now, if there's a doc somebody could point me at, I'll gladly go read it and I'll try to catch up on this conversation so I can understand how we want to deploy it and manage it. But, uh, but right now I don't, from an extension perspective, I totally get the usage of CRDs. It makes 100%, makes totally sense to me, right? But from a core API perspective, I, I don't get it. Um, I think you can look at Daniel Smith's slides from KubeCon this year, uh, and um, that's at least a starting point. I'll still revert to my, my cat trophy analogy. <laughs> um, yes, so I, I don't think that um, we should be adjudicating decisions that have been more or less laid down from SIGARCH, uh, unless we want to take it back to SIGARCH and re-argue that actually this is really hard and we shouldn't do this now. Um, I'm sure there'll be some um, fists shaken at us if we do that, but uh, my, I think the main point here is to figure out <clears throat> if we can come up with a mental model for who's responsible for this. 
And I think the, the stuff that I sort of hand waved at is how I've been thinking about it. Whether that sort of bundle payloader is a SIG cluster life cycle or SIG um, machinery. Uh, you know, the more we talk about it, actually, the more it feels like it is actually sort of cluster life cycle. The, the, maybe the mechanism is machinery and the payload itself is life cycle. Um, but it feels like it's not that hard of a problem for where we are today. I do think it's worthwhile to try to play that out two years and see if it's still applied. Otherwise, we'll end up with another add-on manager. Why is this different from the add-on manager? Because the add-on manager, A, there is no the add-on manager. Yeah, there's uh, that. But. Um, and the add-on manager is things that are strictly optional. And that's sort of how it's been thought about. And uh, because there is no one true add-on manager, every distro has more or less than right. I don't think it's reasonable to send Saad and Michelle and, and Shane and everybody else off to go talk to five different teams about their five different cluster uh, lifecycle projects to get their core API. But I guess um, if, if one of the main goals of moving to CRDs is that we're eating our own dog food, then it feels like we should have one way of installing these extensions. I agree. That's what I'm arguing. For. I think yeah, I think we're all arguing for that. It's like you need a central authority. It's just a question of where and who and what you call it. Yeah, I think we need a um, an API server schema loader uh -huh. that could be its own component. And you point it at something, which mm -hmm. is your schema payload, and it does the work. And that will be the add-on manager, or like the ish. <laughs> I think it's I think it's more narrow we have add-on managers we have. No, we'll replace them. Add-on managers for add-ons are a thing right now, and I don't think we're having the discussion about whether we should try to nuke those, right? I would love to have that conversation. That's not this one. This conversation is, I think, should we create something that is different from add-on managers just for this purpose? Mm -hmm. Right? Which we could then go out to each of the cluster lifecycle projects and say, hey, new component, or maybe it's just part of the controller manager, but like this thing is, is present and you need to make sure that the payload is part of your cluster installation, mm -hmm. right? And at some point in the future, conformance will ensure that, your, that the CRDs are loaded or something like that. I, I think it's the, we don't necessarily need to even to specify the mechanism. We need, we need to have an existence proof for the mechanism, but it does spec we need to specify a, or it seems that we need to specify a, a common payload. Right. We need to say that this set of things is a payload that all conformant Kubernetes clusters are going to have to install at some point. You might choose to do something different. I have a dog in this fight. I'd love everyone to use my dog, but it feels like someone else could very well choose a different dog and, and use that dog. Sure, that's fair. That's a fair distinction. I don't actually care if they run the one true binary or not. I care that they end up with the same result. Yeah. Uh, and today, to get a working API, you run the API server. And what we're describing is, at minimum, to get a working API, you run the API server and then load a manifest. And if that manifest uh, is not just declarative, but also has callouts to different various types of webhooks, you also need to ensure those webhooks are running. And so it could be a sidecar of the API server or something. It could be a sidecar. It could be a separately started process that gets routed to. It could be running in a pod. It, like there are a lot of possibilities and like every cluster has its own way of looking at how components are started, right? Some start with system D, some start with static pods. Some don't run kubelets on the master, some do. Uh, some have restrictions about going back to local host. Some expect all processes to be on other machines like that's why as soon as it's no longer just the API server or just the API server plus a declarative manifest, it kind of fragments into lots of opinions. And uh, Tim, you probably have uh, a good idea of the landscape, but at the same time, I know that cluster lifecycle tends to be like, here's a landscape, here's like the one or two paths we're gonna take in it. If you wanna take your own path, Cool. Um, I, I worry about cluster lifecycle owning 
something that is going to have to satisfy all of those various um, topologies and cluster setup. We typically don't like we usually what we do is we let we let the world fragment, but then we try to distill down the common user stories into uh, a, a tool that we can actually manage and maintain. Because if we tried to take on the estate space of uh, <laughs> de evolution, it becomes it becomes untenable, right? And that's exactly what happened with all the installers, right? So we we found a common use case and a set of use cases that made a ton of sense for a lot of folks and we distilled around that and uh, I think so long as we come out with something that's tenable for people who could use it both with inside of uh, some of the major Kubernetes project or sync cluster lifecycle projects as well as uh, outside then you know we we have choices right and let let them, you know, blast their own foot off. That's that's what we, that's part of our charter, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I do think all out shotguns for everybody. I, I do think the suggestion, the inadvertent suggestion, the Freudian slip suggestion of uh, KubeADM is probably the right way to go there, right? Like, if this was a KubeADM phase, there were some timing things as well with KubeADM. If this was a KubeADM phase, I would hope that everyone would basically adopt whatever KubeADM did if they could, uh, like if they weren't blocked from it for other reasons. So I would love to see this be a Kubernetes phase. I'd love to see COPS adopt that. I'd love to see other tooling adopt that. And I would hope that would actually be, like I don't think we're different for the sake of being different or in the community. I think people are different because they have restrictions. And I would hope that if we can find something that doesn't have that, if we try it, find something that doesn't have that many restrictions, I would I would hope that, or isn't, isn't different because of those restrictions, I would hope that everyone would just adopt. Actually so for the place. sake of um, forward progress, I'm sitting here trying to think about what next steps are. Um, and I still don't think it's fair to throw um, the storage team or the runtime class team, as it were, uh, under the bus on this and say, you guys go up and come up with a solution. I actually think this is something that is broader than that. And um, we should probably have a small group of people who have the right experience to draft, if not a proposal, then at least a an exploration, you know, two paragraphs on uh, five different possible models. And then we could actually have a discussion on, on something more concrete. Does that sound fair? Because I'm about to volunteer people. And Justin, you're on my screen right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was going to propose that uh, Justin, Jordan, myself, and Tim St. Clair uh, convene a doc wherein we can sort of brainstorm potentially concrete models like what if we did it this way, what if we did it that way, and then we can argue about the merits of those and bring that to this broader group for feedback and then to Sigar if needed. Does that sound fair? That sounds totally fair. I think the question I'm going to have is time frame. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of drowning right now. Yeah, and um, this the unfortunate situation we're in is if we don't get our asses in gear, then this misses, snapshots misses the 114 bus, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not even snapshot. This is CSI migration. CSI will miss the 114 bus. CSI migration. Uh, and runtime class, I don't know what your plans are. Beta 114. The goal is beta 114. The goal for CSI beta. migration is beta 114. So if we postpone this too far or if we bike shed too vigorously, uh, they will miss the bus. And that is, I think, if this is a blocker for beta, I'm still, I, from my perspective, I'm comfortable saying that you must have the runtime class CRD installed before you can set up runtime classes and pods should run with the null runtime class. Yeah, the, the more optional and the more uh, tolerant components all along the pipeline are of these things being missing, we have way more leeway on uh, like set up your cluster. If you decide this feature is valuable to you, you can install it. Like I, as long as we have like a manifest <laughs> that lets them load it, um, and they can load it after the fact. 
or via the add-on manager or via cube control or via whatever, I, I think we have way more leeway. Yeah, we would happily defer because there's plenty of post-process steps that occur past bootstrapping. Like even installing the CNI is considered a separate step past bootstrapping. I mean, you, you still have kind of the questions about lifecycle and like when you upgrade or when you get a new version of this thing or uh, some of those questions are still there, but uh, I think they're way easier to answer or at least give good guidance or documentation or like. So Tim says it's feasible. So Michelle, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think uh, for the migration use case, the CSI CRDs we have, we could assume that the user would install them. We need some sort of guarantees, right? Well, who's the target of your beta? Google users, open source users? So it was PD and AWS. It would be, yeah. It would be Should bad. I just clarify one, one thing? Sorry, I had to switch to Cheng's computer because my microphone wasn't working. But what our targets are was beta for CSI node info, uh, which, which allows for an alpha of migration. And the migration shim itself is not, like back to Jordan's point where he was talking about how we could be, like if we're resilient to these CRDs not existent, then it gives us some more leeway. The problem with the migration is that we're shimming the, the entry plugins like GCE and AWS to CSI. So there's really no like fallback plan if the CRDs don't exist. If the CRDs don't exist in that case, then the shim breaks and you no longer have GCE or AWS in that case. And the shim exists in where? In the partially in the kubelet, partially in the attached detached controller. And provisioner. And provisioner. So the, the CSI info, node info API is what lets those components communicate status and whether a particular persistent volume implementation is being satisfied via CSI. That's correct. Yeah. So I, I guess I would. It's, it's been a while since I've dug into it, so I, I apologize, but I, I would ideally like to see these components, if the, if the new API that's being used to communicate this is not present, um, having those continue with their current behavior. Uh, I know there, there are some timing issues to think through, like if, if the components start up and then and they look and this API isn't around, and so they start sticking with existing behavior and then you know an hour later or a day later the user or some add-on manager drops in this api um like thinking through what would happen and is it safe is it do things keep working the way we expect um i think we need to think through that but like i said the more the more optional and more tolerant we are of the absence of these things the easier it's going to be to roll them out via various mechanisms. And honestly, the more you think through them, the better off we'll be anyway. Sure, we can talk about this at some later time as well. Uh, but from what I know so far and what I've thought through, uh, they're pretty required. Maybe we can think of a different solution, though. Um, but for now, if if we don't have this installation method mechanism, I think all the timelines for at least migration and CSI node input will slip. Um, if we're only focusing on those two providers today, could you do something like, uh, stop me uh, when you get it, um, like a flag that the providers let us say, hey, I'm asserting that these things exist, that I want to begin the migration. I want, I want the shim to be active and you'd effectively have the old version of the driver and the shimmed version of the driver together and based on a feature gate or a flag or something, you flip which mode you're operating in and since we're only targeting a couple of providers initially, you know, the damage is relatively limited. So some of that already existed. Um, I, I think that the distinction was, uh, maybe David, we would only fail the kubelet startup if the kubelet asserted that migration was on, if migration was not yet on, um, it would tolerate its absence. Yeah, 
That's correct. So this, this is post assertion that you've already want to turn migration on, then it's like, if the CRD doesn't exist, then we. And then it's because you don't keep the old version of the driver and the new version of the driver at the same time. Uh, we're shimming the old version of the driver to the new version of the driver. Yeah, and so I'm saying you could add one more uh, if outside that, that test would be like is instead of failing to load, if I can't find the CSI node info, then I'm just going to call back the old version. Uh, and um, it's unfortunate because you have to keep all that around and you just have to work through the what if that changes in real time. Sure. The issue, sorry to cut you off, but the issue, the issue kind of lies within the version skew problem. So we can talk about this more later if you want, but uh, the issue lies within the fact that the master can be two versions higher than the kubelet and the master, the attached detach controller specifically in our case does not have any visibility into whether feature flags are on or off in the kubelet. Um, and if the kubelet is too low of a version, it also doesn't, it might not even have knowledge per se of the shim of migration. Okay, well, let's, um, we don't need to do it here, but let's think through if there's a handshake that we can figure out. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, other work that Saad has done to figure out a handshake between kubelets and controllers. Yeah. Uh, it was not pretty, but it's not impossible. Sure, our handshake design right now is through CSI node info, but I guess I didn't foresee all of this. I, I just kind of expected CSI node info to exist, but Understood. this is why we're having this CRD discussion. Um, okay, so let's see what we can do in terms of feasibility there. I will um, take the action to A, start a doc and share it with the four people listed. Anybody else who really wants to participate is welcome to. I just wanted to try to insulate people who don't need to. Um, I'll start the doc and share it and see if we can schedule something in a couple of weeks to get those people together. Okay, and then uh, on our end, uh, I guess we'll sync up and see if we can try to be uh, more robust uh, for the migration if CSI node info doesn't exist uh, and that would unblock us. So we'll So in general, it sounds like Tim is, or Tim Alclair, my counterpart, is is relatively unblocked, uh, which is totally fine. The CSI is temporarily blocked, which could potentially be unblocked by uh, some possible handshake apparatus uh, and doing it post-process when we still have yet to TBD. Uh, I do think whatever we decide on for potential options for management of this should probably eventually go before SIG Arch for the long run of what, how we're gonna do this thing going forwards, right? Cause this is like the pilot case, right? I think of SIG Arch as the um, this committee for this whole idea of everything becomes a CRD. All right, we have freeze up. I think we're good. Uh, well, thank you everyone for your time. And then uh, we'll follow up offline on the two different meetings and uh, go from there. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you for organizing. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Where is the problem? Oh,